for the past uh, few weeks, we've been hearing from other leaders in our church, uh, and I'm so glad that we've been able to hear them. I think I've spoken to several of you who have told me that it was a blessing to hear from uh, our other leaders, our other elders in training, as well as uh, our man and pastor. Because this is an opportunity for us to understand and to get to know the leaders in this church. Because it, shouldn't, it should never be just me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm John, and I serve as one of the pastors on staff here. Uh, and I count it as a great blessing to do that. I'm very blessed by a team of fellow pastors, as a team of uh, lay leaders as well, so that we can serve together. Uh, and I just want you to know that as I sit there and watch these other leaders come forward to preach, I, I don't bring one, but I, I wouldn't mind bringing a flag going, yeah, that's great. I'm, <laughs> I'm back there going, yeah, you know, maybe not so openly. But inside, I'm rooting for all of them because I am blessed by their lives. Uh, I am encouraged by the, way in which, the ways in which they pursue God. And I am blessed by the going forth of the word, regardless of who it comes from, but especially when it comes from brothers that I know and that I trust. And that I know it's not just word, it's not just lip service. It's something that comes from their hearts. So I hope and pray that you have been blessed by that time as well. Well, we're turning, uh, we're, we're going to look at the Old Testament uh, this morning. And this is, since this is not really part of a series, it's sort of like a, I, I guess like a, a collection of different sermons about different topics. I decided, well, it's, it's, it's a one-off. I've spent the majority of uh, this year, this calendar year, preaching from Ephesians. So let's go to the Old Testament. God's word is full of many different stories. And as a child growing up in the church, I would love reading about the different Bible characters. I'd love reading about these stories, Noah and the flood, Daniel and the lion's den, David and Goliath. I, I loved learning those. I loved reading these stories because they were engaging and they were gripping. And when I read these familiar stories, I basically take the posture in the seat of an observer. I'm watching the story play out. I'm imagining things happening in my mind. I can see the events as they unfold. And I can almost put myself in different people's positions and kind of go, oh, I, I could see where this person is thinking. I could see the choice that is laid out before them. And I'm able to understand and to see how events and decisions contribute to the outcome. I'm able to see how disordered desires develop into disobedience that is ultimately dishonoring to the Lord. Today, we're going to examine a, the life of a famous man in Scripture, and his name is Saul. Saul. So let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. And since the Old Testament spans thousands of years, I think it's important that we understand where we are in the flow of biblical history whenever we come to a passage that we haven't been studying for a while. So just to catch us up to speed, fast flyover, after God liberates Israel from their slavery in Egypt under, through Moses, God would lead them into the promised land under Joshua. So rescued through Moses and, and, and entrance into the promised land with Joshua. And as the Israelites settled into the land of Canaan, they would become separated geographically according to their tribes. During the period of the judges, which follows the death of Joshua, various tribes would cooperate from time to time to defeat a common enemy. But for the most part, it was sort of, they were not really connected or united. They would, they would, bond, they would bond together for a common purpose to defeat a common enemy. But other than that, it's we go back to our respective areas in our tribes. As a fragmented nation, this was difficult for the Israelites to endure. They looked for some means to have stability in the land. 
Because whenever there was a threat, it was a threat, well, it's a threat to the Southeast. Let's let the, let's let the tribes to the Southeast deal with that. Oh, there's another threat, Northwest. Okay, well, let's let them deal with that. And, and so it was very distressing to the Israelites. And they wanted a solution. They wanted a permanent solution. They were tired of hearing about, okay, this group of people need our help, so can we send any men to go fight on that? Okay. You know, they were tired of hearing all of this. They wanted some way to stabilize the situation in the promised land. And they looked around at the other nations and they said, these other people groups, they've got kings. And this king manages it. Why don't we get a king? And so the Israelites asked Samuel, the last judge, for a king to rule over them. They said, we want a king. We want to be like the other people around us. We don't want to have to keep rallying the troops together and marshalling resources to go fight this group and then that group and that group. We just want a king. We'd, we'd like a standing army. We'd like some sort of, some rules over all of us. We want to be united. And though, is, though, though the Lord was saddened by their request, he answered them by commanding Samuel to go and anoint Saul to be the first king over Israel. And during this time, what they would do is to reveal God's will to people. They would cast lots. And so Samuel summoned the Israelites together. And he said, look, let's gather. Let's get all the, the leaders of all these various tribes together. Let's come here. Let's meet together. Y'all ask for a king. God has answered. And he is revealing whom, who he has, whom he has chosen as king through the casting of lots. And so they cast lots. And the lots pointed to Saul which God had already told Samuel, and Samuel had already anointed him. So he was like pre-anointed, right? He was pre-anointed, but then revealed for the whole nation of leader, the, the leaders of the nation to see and to witness for themselves. But Saul had a fatal flaw in his life. And you'll see it come up over and over again as a theme which came to characterize his life, and ultimately doomed his reign as the first king over Israel. You see, Saul struggled with caring more about what, are, what other people thought than about what God thought. Saul was always looking around when he should have been looking up. He was looking at opinion polls and wondering what people think rather than asking first and foremost, would this be pleasing to the Lord? <clears throat> so the Israelites, after they've identified, okay, here it is. We've cast lots. It's Saul of the tribe of Benjamin who is supposed to be our next king. They couldn't find him. After it was, you know, the lots were cast and it, it all points to Saul, they couldn't find him. And they couldn't find him because he was hiding among the baggage. No doubt, tentative and afraid of being publicly identified. You see, even there, from his inauguration as king, he's already concerned about what other people think. When Saul eventually emerges from hiding among the baggage, everybody looked at him, and they were sizing him up. This, this guy, this guy. And they found that Saul was a good-looking guy in his favor, and he also stood a head taller than all of his compatriots. He was a tall and good-looking guy. This is your stereotypical, classic leader profile. He's tall. People look up to him physically and I guess psychologically. And he's a good-looking guy. And, you know, there's, there's always points for being good-looking. And so, you know, Saul is there. And, in, you know, basically you feel as if, you, I imagine in my mind, it's like a gigantic spotlight beamed down and just hit Saul, you know, so that his forehead glistened with sweat. So, you know, he's just like, everybody's looking at him. Everybody's sizing him up. And when they finally see him and they examine him, the people were divided over Saul as being their first king. Some people 
said, there's none like him among all the people. Oh, this is the one. He must be the chosen one, not only by lots, but he looks the part. And then other people said, how in the world can this man save us? Really? This guy? This guy? This is our first king? Hmm. So you can see, even from his first moments as king, Saul lived under the microscope. He lived in a fishbowl of sorts, and people are looking at him. And he is concerned about what they think about him. Some people would accept him as king, and others would not. And as the new king, Saul had an assignment. And his first and most pressing assignment was to deal with the Ammonite threat. Now, earlier in 1 Samuel 11, Nahash the Ammonite, he's a leader among the Ammonites, he laid siege to a city in Israel named Jabesh Gilead. And when the residents of that city begged for a peace treaty, they're like, we'd like to make peace with you. Can you, can you just not attack us? Again, at this point in time, there's no standing army Okay, if, if you were attacked as a city, if you don't have enough residents as a city to go and repel and defend your city, then you're, you're conquered. But this city sends out emissaries and said, okay, can we make peace with you? Can we strike a bargain? And Nahash replies, on this condition, I will make a treaty with you that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. Nahash, the Ammonite, didn't just want to defeat the city. He wanted to make an example of them, almost like a calling card. Yeah, every time you see a guy with the right eye out, you'll remember Nahash, the Ammonite, is mighty, and he was able to conquer this city. And they were in such a desperate situation, I'd give my right eye to get out of this situation. Nahash was out to embarrass them, not just to defeat them. And so in response, Saul calls upon Israel for help. This is one of his first acts as king. He says, okay, all of Israel, I need help. Okay, I need help. And 300, and scripture tells us that 330,000 men respond to the call. There's a huge response and they soundly defeat the Ammonites in battle and they liberate the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. And as a result of this military victory, the whole nation is united with Saul. Saul has accomplished victory. This is what we wanted by having a king. We want a king who gives us peace and and settles the threats from other people. This king did it. So Saul, you have our vote of confidence. And as a result, so as a result of this, Saul's leadership as king is solidified. And then we come to our passage this morning, which is found in 1 Samuel 13, verses 1 to 14. So look with me there and follow along with me as I read it. It says, Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it and heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and six thousand horsemen and troops, like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth, Beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Verse 8, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what? Have you done? 
And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. This morning in our study will be marked by three descriptive points. And each point kind of tells us part of the story. But first, let's talk a little bit about the geography. Let's understand the layout, and what is going on. Saul's been reigning now for about two years, and the episode occurs early in his reign, given that, Saul, that Acts 13 verse 21 tells us that Saul reigned over Israel for a total of 40 years. So this is really early in his reign. And I put up two maps here on the screen. The map to the left, to your left, shows you that there were different people groups occupying this land of Canaan. The Ammonites, who threatened Jabesh Gilead, occupied the Orange Territory. So it's to the, to the east, right? And in our passage today, Saul has to deal with a threat from the Philistines, who are coming from the Red Territory. This is towards the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the map on the right shows you that eventually Israel would come to occupy that light purple region. That is Israel's territory under the reign of Saul. And so that means that Saul faced a lot of battles. He had to fight against a lot of different people groups during his time as the first king of Israel. So during this period of Saul's reign, the Philistines from the Red Territory were causing all sorts of problems for Israel. In fact, 1 Samuel 4 verse 9 reveals that the Philistines had enslaved part of Israel. And geographically, to the southwest of Israel, Philistia uh, was a neighbor, and they were not a friendly neighbor. And since Israel did not have a standing army, they were not able to defend themselves against the Philistine people. Now, that being said, even though Philistine, the Philistines were basically ruling over Israel, this portion of Israel at this time, the Philistines have this sort of uh, this kind of weird posture towards them. As long as you don't make too much trouble, we'll let you do whatever you want. Because notice, just earlier when I talked about Nahash and the Ammonite, Nahash the Ammonite and Saul basically gathered all these people to fight against them, Philistines didn't do anything. Kind of like, this isn't my fight. If my enemy, who have I subdued, wants to fight with other people, let them do that, as long as they don't fight against us. But all of that changes. And the status quo changes in verses 2 to 4. Look with me. It says, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. So here is an escalating encounter with the Philistines. 330,000 men were summoned to defeat the Ammonites. That's fine. But Saul only kept 3,000. Very few people, very few men. In all likelihood, Saul did not want the Philistines to get the wrong idea. 3,000 men was not enough to wage a war against the Philistines. But even at this, Saul split up the group of 3,000 into two groups, 2,000 with Saul, 1,000 with his son, Jonathan. And under Jonathan's command, these 1,000 Israelites attacked a garrison of Philistines at Geba. Now, up until this point of his reign, Saul has never directly challenged the Philistines. He has not gone toe-to-toe with them. But Jonathan's encounter has led to murmurs among Israel. Hey, we've got a king now. We defeated the Ammonite threat, and these Philistines are annoying to us. 
but there may be a chance here. And so the Philistines are angry. They're furious. How dare these little Israelites challenge us? The Philistines are not going to tolerate this. So the mighty Philistines have been angered and they're out for blood. They want to annihilate this insignificant Israelite force so that they can send a clear message to Israel that no, you cannot rebel against us. We are still in charge. Knowing that the Philistines were gathering for war, Saul calls out for help and he sends word to the rest of Israel to assemble for war. But they're overwhelmingly outnumbered. Verse five. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Aven. So having been stirred up by Jonathan's attack, the Philistines bring 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen to defeat 3,000 Israelites. Doing the math, it's 12 to 1. This is overkill. This would be the equivalent of taking a sledgehammer to kill a fruit fly. This is overkill. What were you planning to do? They intend to send a clear statement to the Israelites that this kind of these kinds of things are not tolerated. Oh, no, you didn't, is basically what they're doing. And so as a result of that, the Israelites who are with Saul, they recognize they are far outnumbered. All 3,000 of them are, have, no, have no chance. They are outnumbered 12 to 1. What will they do? And so they're demoralized, and then they desert Saul. Look with me at verses 6 to 7. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan, the river Jordan, to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Now you get the picture here that they're all running for their lives. When's the last time you tried to hide in a tomb? It's pretty desperate. It's pretty desperate. In the face of a massive Philistine army headed their way, Saul's soldiers are demoralized. They begin to desert. Like this, the hope is gone. I might as well get out. They're afraid for their lives. And in their minds, there's no way that they could possibly defeat this overwhelming force. Given the imbalance, there was a chance, there was a high likelihood that every single Israelite would die. If the Philistines really wanted to make a statement, none shall live. 12 to 1, they got the, they've got the manpower to accomplish it. And so they hid in fear. And so this leads to what is Saul going to do in the face of this dangerous dilemma? And it leads to a desperate disobedience. A desperate disobedience. What will Saul do and how will he respond? What kind of king is Saul? Look with me at verses 8 to 10. It says, he waited, Saul, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Facing this difficult situation, Saul decides to offer up this sacrifice himself. Now, as a little bit of a background here, Samuel had previously communicated to Saul to wait seven days, and then he'll come and offer up sacrifice. <clears throat> the order was to wait seven days, but he didn't. He was seeing that he was delayed in coming. Well, this is like the end. You're, you're really waiting till the, till the last minute here. <clears throat> and Saul is looking at 36,000 Philistines. I'm outnumbered 12 to 1. 
And the people who follow me are hiding in tombs. Some of them skipped and ran so far that they skipped over the river. What am I supposed to do here? I'm losing the support of my force, which is already at full strength, outnumbered 12 to 1. This is a desperate situation. Saul is wondering what in the world's going on. These people will not follow me. What are we supposed to do? And therefore, Saul chooses to offer those sacrifices up himself. And he commits a grievous sin. Now, one of the things we know about, <clears throat> about sin is that sin, sin's like, like grapes. They show up in clusters. So it's not just one sin. It's usually a, a bunch of them all together. They come in groups. So let's break down. When Saul sins by offering up the sacrifice, what else has happened? First, he's been impatient. <clears throat> he is lacking the ability to wait and to be patient for Samuel. Samuel is God's priest. Samuel is representative of God. Samuel would know what to do. And I'm sure that Saul was originally fine with waiting for Samuel, but as the clock continued ticking, Samuel, uh, Saul grew impatient. Where is this guy? Why wasn't he coming? Didn't he say seven days? Didn't Samuel know how dangerous the situation is? What is he doing? Where is this guy? There was also general distrust in God, which Saul sees Samuel as God's representative. Why in the world would God allow this situation to happen? Why would God appoint Saul to be king only to have him die in battle? Are we going for shortest reign? What, what are we doing here? I'm going to die here. Wasn't God for Israel? Aren't we his chosen people? Why would, God, why would a good God allow thousands of men to die at the hands of Philistines who mock God? There was also disobedience to a plain command. As the seeds of doubt in Saul's mind are sown, and as they grow and blossom, Saul has lust for control. I need to gain control of this situation. People are leaving me. I got to do something. I got to win them back. I got to fix it. So Saul took matters into his own hands. He decided to do something that would restore people back to him. I need to do something so that people will feel comfortable to follow me. And so he offered up sacrifices. Now, while it is true that kings are God's anointed men, it is also true that God appointed priests to offer up those sacrifices. Leviticus chapter 6 specifically charges priests to offer sacrifices. So this is something that, uh, yeah, you may be the anointed king of Israel, but you're not allowed to do this. Fourthly, Saul also had a deep desire to have the respect of others. Let's think about what is happening in Saul's heart when he decides to offer up these sacrifices, verses 11 and 12. It says, <clears throat> Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, this is his explanation, his own words. Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Saul offers three reasons to explain what he has done. He has clearly sinned, but he's now excusing his sin. He's explaining why. What led him to such a desperate act of disobedience? I saw that the people were scattering from me. People are leaving. They're abandoning our side, and we can't afford to lose them. We need to get them back. I saw that you did not come within the appointed days. <clears throat> Lo and behold, the text never says that Samuel was actually late because as soon as Saul finished offering it, Samuel came. Bad timing. Um, on the seventh day, Saul offered up the sacrifices just as Samuel walked up. Third, the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Saul was afraid of the Philistine army. 
He was afraid of the threat from people. He was looking around, but not up. <clears throat> After all, Saul should have remembered who God was. This is the God who rescued them out of their slavery in Egypt. This is the God who caused the walls of Jericho to tumble and fall. This is the God who parted the Red Sea. This is the God who loves and cares for them as his people. And this is something I need to highlight for you here is that this is one of Saul's sin patterns. This is one of those things that came to characterize his life. Saul disobeys again a little later after 1 Samuel 13. In chapter 15, God sends Saul on a mission, and he sends Saul to go and annihilate, to wipe out, to exterminate a group known as the Amalekites. As punishment, God declared they will be punished, and God decided to use Saul and Israel to punish them. And God was very clear, I don't want you to punish, I don't want you to punish them and plunder them. I want you to punish them, period. You are not to use this, this uh, command from me as an opportunity to put to line your pockets. God said, I want you to wipe them out and leave. I don't want you to pocket anything. I don't want you to take anything home. I don't want you to take any souvenirs or plunder and hoard. I, I, no, that's not what you are to do. And to carry out God's orders, Saul gathered some 210,000 men to fight the Amalekites. Instead of obeying God's instructions, Saul kept some of the livestock and spared King Agag. And when confronted by Samuel, Saul explained that he was going to offer up the livestock as sacrifices to God. And Samuel responds famously by saying that, does God delight in burnt offerings as much as obedience to his word? Saul then pleads with Samuel to forgive him. And, and I want you to listen to this. When Samuel refuses, <clears throat> Samuel refuses this. And instead, Samuel tells Saul that because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected you as king over Israel, Say, meaning that none of Saul's children would ever sit on the throne. So how does Saul respond to this dreadful message? You've just received this punishment, this decree of punishment. Saul says this, I have sinned. Good, that's a good start. But then he says this, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Saul has just been rejected by God as king. But Saul is more concerned about how it looks to other people. Saul is essentially telling Samuel, okay, I've been punished by God, and I'm not going to rule on this throne for very much longer, and my children will never rule and sit on this throne of Israel. But you know what? Let's just pretend that everything's okay. Shake hands with me, smile with me, walk with me. We'll kind of see buddy, buddy, step in step, and we'll just kind of play it like that. Why? Because he's concerned about what other people think. He wants to look good from far, but he is actually far from good. He wants to look good in front of others, when he has failed before God. Saul has lost God's respect, but somehow Saul still wants the respect of other people. And so this leads to his dismal destiny, <clears throat> verses 13 to 14. But now you're, oh, sorry, verse 13, it says, but, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then verse 15 is Samuel leaves. And so this this results in two judgments from God. Saul's fate is sealed. First, it, rec it, mean it means that the, there is an end to Saul's dynasty. Saul's dynasty will end with his death. Jonathan will never sit on the throne of Israel. 
Now, of course, there are a couple of possibilities as to how this would happen. There would be a coup. Someone from within Israel will take over. Or, which is the one, or the second possibility, which is one that ended up happening, is that Saul and his whole family would die, such that his family would be wiped out, such that no one would be able to rule in his place. Second, a second uh, result of his sin is the, emergency of a, uh, the emergence of a new ruler in David. This is described as David being a man after his own heart. And so there you have it. Saul has sealed his own fate. By his own actions, he has invited judgment from God because he cared about what other people thought more than what God thought. He had a people problem. It wasn't that he was antagonizing people. He had a people problem because people loomed larger in his mind than God. He was obsessed with what other people thought about him. And since he was the first king ever in the history of Israel, he was tempted to look at his abilities, his leadership, his accomplishments, his victories, his character. Saul was obsessed with making himself great in the eyes of other people. And lest we be so critical... We all have a bit of Saul in us. We care what people think. We want to be great in the eyes of other people. We want to be appreciated for all that we are. We want to be affirmed. We want to be validated. We want to be admired. Every single one of us wants to be something. We want to be somebody's. We don't want to be nobody. We want to be someone whose name is mentioned, not a footnote. We never dream about being ordinary and forgettable. You don't dream about mediocrity, do you? You don't dream about doing as a mediocre work. It just passes muster. You don't dream about it, right? You dream about doing something great, something grand, something life-changing, history-shaping, something significant, something that people would look at and say, wow. You don't dream about mediocrity. You dream about doing something extraordinary. And the problem with dreaming for these things or longing for these things is that we are looking more around us and less above us. Lusting and desiring the approval of other people is a temptation. And sometimes it can compel you or propel you to do certain things. Let me give you a few examples. We don't have time to get into every single one of that. But when you desire someone else's approval or anybody else's or or people's applause, man's applause, here are some examples of what it leads to, what what it can tempt you to. It can tempt you to idolizing other people Idolizing other people will tempt you to exaggerate your own virtues. You ever said that you're great when you're actually good? It also could lead you to minimizing your own flaws, right? Instead of confessing your sin openly and honestly, you'll minimize your sin. Well, it's not that bad. Even even number one, exaggerate your own flaws. Have you ever done this? You know you cook this fantastic meal. And yet you still say, oh, I don't know. Was it okay? You know what that is? It's fishing for compliments. That's what that is. That's just kind of like, let me hear you. I'm going to hear you. I don't know. Was it really that good? Let me hear it again. Let me hear it one more time. Let me, well, you know, the sear was a little bit off, just a little bit off. You're just recasting. You just kind of look, hey, can I hear it more? Oh, it was, it was great. It was, it was the best you've ever had. That sounds great. I think I'm done fishing for today. Right? We do this because we care about what other people think. We want them to laud us. We want them to applaud us. We want them to think well of us. Idolizing other people can tempt you to, it can also tempt you to magnify the seriousness of your own flaws. As if you were perfect to begin with. I can't believe I did that. Because you think you're perfect? Idolizing other people will tempt you to change things in your life according to man's priorities rather than the agenda of the Holy Spirit. In other words, if I have to change something, let me change the things on the outside because they're easier rather than changing things on the inside. 
fix the things that look bad rather than fix everything that is bad. Idolizing other people will, draw, will focus your attention on outer behavior instead of heart change, similar to number four. And number six, an excessive love of praise will convince you to believe man's opinion of yourself over God's opinion of you. Well, people think I'm grand. People think I'm great, so I'm fine. Rather than God knows better, God searches the heart. It is God who sees and knows everything. And I may be able to fool people from the outside. I may be able to put up a good front. But inside, I know that I've got rotten things in my life. And I desperately need Jesus. So how do we practically deal with the problem of caring too much about what other people think? Well, here's a start. It's not the exhaustive answer, but here's a start. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, this verse outlines a twofold strategy for fighting against the sin of fearing people. First, do not fear other people. And you can do this by putting things in perspective. Who are you? And who are they? Remind yourself that you are here and they are also here. You're on a different plane from God. They're just other people. Who are you? If you are in Christ, you have been redeemed by the blood of the Son of God. You have been emancipated from your slavery to sin. You have been adopted into God's family and no one can take that away. No one is strong enough to take you out of God's hand. You are a child of God, not because you're so great, but because God is so gracious. Second, ask yourself, who are they? They are people. They're just like you. They're human beings created in the image of God. They're sinners in need of Jesus. And even if they are saved, they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Second, do fear God. Do not fear others. Do fear God. You increase your fear of God by meditating and learning about who he is. God is worthy of our worship, not just because of what he has done, but because of who he is. Had he done nothing, we would, he would still be worthy of all the worship we could possibly muster. God is worthy to be praised. He is holy. He is just. He is loving. He is caring. He desires and demands our perfect obedience to him, and God created us to worship him. And whenever we fail to worship God, <clears throat> we need to ask for his forgiveness. But also, a failure, a failure to worship God usually leads to worshiping other things. Have you ever been on the beach and dug a hole? It gets filled. In a vacuum, things get filled. Something fills the void. Something fills the vacuum. We are created to worship God, and when we don't, that vacuum demands something to fill it. And so when we fail to worship God, when we fail to focus on God, we're certainly focusing on something else. Something else, someone else, and something is filling that void. Something is taking up residence in our heart as the object of our affection, the object of of our worship. Psalm 110, 111 <clears throat> says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. And the best practical way to increase your fear of the Lord is to read books about God. Read books about God. A.W. Tozer has a book called Knowledge of the Holy. A.W. Pink has one entitled Attributes of God, which is also free to download. The fear of other people is one of the most ensnaring idols of our day. And it's, it's not as easy to see as someone bowing down before a Buddha statue. It's something deeper within. It's something that you know about personally, but it may not be as easy for other people to see. Deep down in all of us, there is a desire to be accepted. There's a desire to be praised. There's a desire to be 
respected. You have been accepted through the Son of Jesus Christ. You have been accepted from God on high, the creator of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who upholds and sustains everything in this world. Yet we clamor for the attention and affection of other people as if God was not important. As if God's opinion didn't matter. When we consider the things that we do in life, we need to ask, will this please the Lord? Not, will this gain me friends? Will this honor my God, my heavenly father? Not, will other people think this is good? I believe that the desire to have the approval from others is one of the hardest battles in our world today. To be honest about your struggles is difficult. To talk about your weaknesses in front of other people can make you feel vulnerable. But in this discomfort, in this falling short, you find and you encounter the grace and forgiveness of God. You experience the transcendent love of God. And so, brothers and sisters, we should care most what God thinks of us. We should long and desire for his approval to please him even when there are times other people are not going to be happy with what we do or what we decide. Because we live for a higher purpose. We live with an eternal mindset. And and, and at times that means that we, we may be open about our shortcomings and our failures. And, And maybe we're afraid, oh, well, if I say that I really struggle with this, I'm going to be lower in somebody else's mind. But God knows all of it. And when we, when we deal with our own shortcomings and failures, it's an opportunity to be helped by other people around us as well. We care so much about what other people think. Perhaps we're too busy looking around and instead should look up. This is our God. This is who we live for. Let him receive our praise and our honor. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for a reminder, Lord, looking at someone else's life. Even in looking at Saul's life, we recognize that we're very similar. We're We're not altogether dissimilar from him. It's a reminder to us, Lord, that we ought to care most what you think, most about how to please you. So, Lord, when we have shortcomings, let us be honest with that. When we have fears, we can be honest with that. Because we know that you already know them all. Lord, when we make decisions, let us not think about what will other people think. Will they think less of me? Will they think more of me? Instead, let us be driven and compelled by how to please you. Yes, Lord, you have called us to yourself. You have adopted us into your family. And we live to worship you. We pray all of this in your son's name.